right, what is going on, guys? It is episode number 25 of the Chasing Waypoints podcast. Yeah. So, for those of you listening in, last week, Baja 500. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. We're recording this on Monday. So, we just got back from Baja 500, helping my brother out. Salt UTV, Adrian Oriana. Good run, third place. Lots of good competition and uh, a bunch of bottlenecks. So, good times. Had a chance to get back into Baja. It was kind of nice and missed it. Weather was awesome. Got a little bit cold in the evening, but nevertheless, lots of fun. So, that was just this past Saturday. You guys are going to be hearing this on Sunday. And we have got another guest for you. We are doing another In the Bivouac this time around. Seems like that's what we've been doing most of, but you know what? There are so many cool people to talk to in the motorcycle industry. So looking forward to, and then not so much motorcycle industry, but the rally world. But this time around, we've got somebody new for you guys. I don't think a lot of people uh, know this guy, or I just met him. Nicest guy ever. Super, super cool. Actually, it was uh, a gnarly Dave that introduced me to him, more or less. And I know he's been doing some riding and some training and then rally and all of that stuff. And uh, I hear he's got a couple of other things up his sleeve. So we're going to talk about that. So while the music's playing, let's get let's get him a link so we can jump in on the fun. Just a second here. Just send the link. Yeah. Rally Kazakh stand is over. Skyler House, if you were listening to this, I want to reach out. I want to talk a little bit about that Rockstar Husky you were riding now. See how that thing is. Sonora Rally is over. Suspension is back from conflict. All sorts of stuff going on. I'm looking forward to riding. I had a lot of fun. Also, if you guys keep an eye out last week's episode that was with none other than chris parker from wattweiler performance so hopefully you guys got a chance to check that out if not rewind to that episode take a listen that was a ton of fun so also going to be a movie coming out here in the next few days they're going to be breaking it up movie premiere is tuesday night but that was about that episode this is about this episode And it looks like we have got Ace on the line here. Let me turn this party down. Ace, you there? I'm here, Victor. How you doing? (laughs) Doing all right, sir. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Uh, The the pleasure is mine, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Okay, so let's see. Where am I going to start with this? All right, first and foremost, how's the wrist? You know, the wrist is is slow to heal. it, it's just, I never thought it was broken, but mm-hmm. the, the longer I go with this thing, the more I, I'm leaning toward it might have a hairline fracture. It just, it just not getting that much better. So I'm continuing to walk around in a split and get that, you know, sympathy every once in a while and tell the story a million times of what happened. But, you know, it'll be all right. Yeah. It heals. It heals. Exactly. But there's a good story behind it. Well, I guess, yeah. (laughs) There's always a story, right? True. Good, bad, ugly, whatever, but it was still fun. It was fun, and we, you know, uh, persevered and kept going and finished it out, so can't complain. And that, I I could see in your face that uh, it it was not comfortable whatsoever, but you still lined up and you still finished the stages. (laughs) Yeah, that was... uh, There was a lot to get to Sonora this year Um, after 2020, you know, my bike and uh, truck and gear and everything was already down and staged in Southern California, ready to make to the trip down to Sonora in 2020. And I don't know if you know or not, but I work at a level one trauma center in Portland and the day before I was to fly out, the uh, president of our entire system came to me and said, I understand you're getting ready to leave. And 
he, he's an old army vet captain he says i'm gonna have to ask you to stay you know mm. the proverbial stuff is about to hit the fan around here and really need you to stay so you know uh we i did and i just basically canceled my plans and fortunately the organizers at sonora were uh graceful and allowed me to bow out of that entry and push it to the next year. And Alex at Conflict and Pan, uh, Rally Pan Am did the same. And so basically I, I hit pause for, you know, a little bit over a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, there wasn't much that wasn't going to keep me from uh, from finishing that rally. Nice. You know, so you just got an, an extra year to prepare for it. Yeah. And fortunately they pushed it back. I was out uh, training in November, um, late November, I think it was November 21st, and, you know, just cruising around the eastern Oregon desert and getting the miles in and trying to prepare, and I came across the cattle guard at speed, and I did something wrong. I still don't know what happened, but I wadded it pretty good fourth gear and um, dislocated and separated my shoulder, and, and that just, you know, put another time crunch on things and trying to get it to heal. And, you know, I went soft. I'm 50 years old now. I just turned 50 in February. So, and I still think I'm 20 at heart. <laughs> <laughs> Dirt bikes have I'm a way one of doing those that. guys that I'm never going to grow old. And yeah, I'm going to wad it hard one day and be done. But anyway, um, went to the physical therapist and she says, and you want to do what in February? And I was supposed to lead a, you know, a big ride with high desert adventures down in Baja. And, um, January 31st, we were leaving and she's like, I can't see you doing a push up in two months from now, let alone riding a motorcycle across the desert. But, you know, we got it done and, um, great, great physicians and, Modern medicine. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, and you were in shape. I mean, you, it, the rally was was definitely challenging uh, for a lot of people. And how? So, and that's really where I got to interact with you. But tell us the yeah. story. I mean, well, how was how was Sonora Rally the experience for you? Was this the first year you did it? I did it in 2019, okay. um, and that was my first real rally ever. Mm-hmm. And kind of doing it again in 2021 was my second real rally ever. <laughs> okay. So I don't have a lot of miles under my belt in the rally world. I've done um, I've done a lot of road books, and I've gone to um, YSR. And for those who know what that is, then you know what that is. Okay. Um, I haven't, you know, I've uh, almost done the Baja Rally once, and just time commitment and stuff like that pushed it off. Mm-hmm. But uh, this this year is full gas. We're going to get as many in as we can, and um, yes, yeah, as soon as this wrist heals up, we're on the we're on the gas again. Nice, yeah, back right back at it. Yeah. So, with that being said, uh, Sonora Rally twenty twenty one being your second rally, what even got you interested in rally? What, where did that start? Interesting. Uh, good question. I've I've been a fan of rally since I can remember. I remember my dad watching. Um, various rallies when I was a kid on, you know, TV and then later on the internet and whatever. Um, but we'd always watch as much as we could find it, you know, every once in a while speed vision would have on the Dakar rally and you get to watch it there. And, um, I've just been a fan of the marathon, anything for a long time, gotcha. whether it's, you know, Ba 1000 or a rally or, um, you know, long stage events. I, I did, you know, triathlons when I was younger and ran a marathon when I was younger. I've just been interested in endurance racing period. So in 2016, you know, I was, um, interacting with Alex from conflict motorsports and, and he said, Hey, I'm, I'm coming up to your neck of the woods up in Oregon. Um, and I'd like to put on a school out there, but I'm having a heck of a time getting the permits. Mm-hmm. And I said, no problem. Done. Let's just hold it on my pre-existing routes that I already have permits for, and I'll take care of it. And he said, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah, done." And so, we'll get into High Desert Adventures a little bit later. But yeah. anyway, I was able to help Alex host a school with Scott Bright and David Beck- Peckham and 
um, among others. And all I did was support the ride, um, brought my truck out and chased people around and found them lost out in the desert, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Shuttled gas and, you know, helped make food and, you know, basically just supported one of Scott Bright's and Alex's schools. And, um, you know, I was watching guys that were, you know, very experienced motorcyclists go off into the desert and come back 10, 15, 20 minutes later, just frustrated as all kid out and not understanding where they made a mistake or this or that. <clears throat> and that was kind of the intent of the first day. And then, you know, Scott gave instruction and in the evening and the next morning and they went out and they did a little bit better. Some still got frustrated, come back, whatever. But you figure out, man, what is so difficult about this? Mm-hmm. So later when I acquired some rally gear, I went out and had to give it a shot myself, went, went out to Pahrump, participated in one of Scott's schools, and I was just bit. I was bit hard. Nice. And it, and it was game on from there. <laughs> game on from there. It just, um, yeah, and, you know, talking to various people and, you know, you start making phone calls. What do I need to do? What, what equipment? You know, I started off with the very most basic setup that you can, clamp on, road book, this and that. Mm-hmm. And um, just, you know, invested the time of learning the nomenclature and figuring out the tulips and how to read a tulip and where you enter it from and what do you do, where is the action at. It just, it all um, really kind of just jazzed me. And it was, you know, it's, it's not motocross. It's not off-road racing even. Um, and And it's... It's kind of that progression um, as far as the the pits are concerned and the people that are involved and and the support of the various companies that are involved. It's the more, and not to bash motocross at all, but the further you get away from that, Mm -hmm. the more personable it is and the more fun it is. Um, So, yeah, and, and that's kind of what I like is just the friendships that I've made and the the challenge, the mental challenge of the game um, is really what interests me. Well, and it's not um, the, the amount of time that the game face is on for is reduced. I guess, yeah. I guess that yeah. would be a way of putting it right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and it's definitely not a sprint. It's, it's more of a marathon, which is, which is what I like. Yeah, the camaraderie. Uh, the the thing that I just is still live for in, the, in this is the, is the bivouac experience. You know, oh yeah, hanging out with everybody, and it's like nobody's a racer at that point. You know, everybody's right. just working on their bikes. <laughs> well, that that's a perfect example of you know uh, kind of the contrast between like pro motocross and then rally. And if you go to you know, I live up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I go to the Washougal National every year that I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And if you walk through the pits, you might catch a glimpse of somebody. You might get really lucky and have somebody sign an autograph or even, you know, talk to you for a couple of seconds. At Rally, you can walk up to any one of the riders in the pits and have a, have a heart-to-heart conversation, ask advice. Um, you know, Happy Dave is a great example of a guy that was riding for Rally Pan Am, the team that I rode on, and he was having issues with his Honda. And, and scratching our heads, you know, and he's like, he walked up to the guys at uh, JCR, said, hey, you know, I have an issue with my bike. Any any chance you might be able to take a look? And you have Johnny Campbell and Eric from, you know, Japan over there mm-hmm. uh, diagnosing and solving a problem in a matter of minutes. It, it, that's unheard of. That's unheard of. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, any other given race, it was probably trade secrets and, you know, well, cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, check the air in the tires. I know it's misfiring, right. <laughs> but check the air in the tires. It's probably that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, realistically, he's probably done if he doesn't have that level of service there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just experiences like that. I was, um, really fortunate in, in that I had two events planned for this time period mm-hmm. and due to the time change of Sonora being pushed back, they, they conflicted with each other. So I was set to do the rip to Cabo on the heels of the Sonora rally mm-hmm. and trying to get two bikes ready and, and ship down to, you know, one to Mexico, one to Southern California, just all that stuff. And, uh, happened to be training with uh, gnarly Dave and, he says, hey, you mind if um, one of my friends joins us? Yeah, no problem. Let's do this. 
And so we go out to run road books and um, Jacob Augerbright shows up. Yeah. Um, oh, that kind of, okay, here we go. We're now, we're now riding with the national hare and hound champion. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't intimidating. Yeah, not at all. You know? <laughs> but at the same time, Jacob had never done a rally. And he'd only ridden to that point. He'd only ridden a few road books, and the the playing field was completely other than him having a whole hell of a lot more talent than me on a motorcycle. the The playing field was pretty level. Like his understanding of road books and his amount of practice mm-hmm. were pretty pretty equal. And we went out, and I mean, over the weekend we put them almost four hundred and fifty miles, and there were sections that I led and made good choices with navigation. And there were sections that he led and, you know, it was, it was just awesome to, you know, feel that camaraderie. And, um, the point I was getting to is, um, he said, how are you getting your bike down to Sonora? I said, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. And he says, why don't you just let me take it? Nice. What? You're <laughs> kidding me. He goes, no, I'd, I'll come over and pick it up. And, We'll, we'll take it down there. He not only took it down there for me, he took it back. And, um, yeah, it was just became friends with him over the few days that we got to hang out and, and since then. So nice. just another example of, you know, the rally family that just grows and grows and grows as the sport grows. Yeah. No, and I, and I, four years, uh, four years, almost five years, actually five years with Baja Rally. And then the two years now that I've gone to Sonora, and yes, more new faces every year. The same faces, some missing, but it's growing, you know, and, and that I think is the biggest, the biggest thing, you know, if we keep spreading the word and, and as people get more and more interested in it. And then, you know, Ricky Brabeck and Skylar Howes and all of these guys doing, you know, good Andrew Short, um, you know, as as we get onto the the international stage as well, I think it's it's only going to help keep growing the sport. But people yeah. Have, People need to get into the bivouacs. I think the bivouac will sell more people. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. I just this this year at Sonora was a great example. All those names you mentioned, plus uh, Nacho Cornejo yeah. coming all the way across the pond. Um, um, Kendall Norman showing up as like wow. You know, you yeah. just you're just rubbing elbows with legends, and you know, I I respect their time, and you know, I don't. I'm not one to just go up and sit and chat, but it just, it's just cool seeing them down there in the pits and hanging out. And, you know, half the time you're running them to a, you know, in a, in a dinner line or for breakfast or whatever. And it's just, you know, they're just normal guys. They put on their boots the same way everybody else does and they go out and ride their motorcycle and they're just out there having a good time. Exactly. Yeah. Justin, uh, who else do we have? Uh, Justin Morgan also down there as well. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was it, it's crazy. All of a sudden, it's like you got all of these these top level guys. Um, then the young gun, <laughs> you know, down the right. road is it, it nineteen years old? <laughs> mm-hmm. Making it happen, Mason. Mason so, killing it, it. Yeah. So it's 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 crazy, and and everybody is family. No, you know, nobody's walking around with with attitudes. Nobody. Everybody's chill. Everybody's you know having fun, and so that's uh, so great. So I. I thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I still thought I saw a picture of you with the guys on the rip. Did you did you move down that way after? Or I did. Um, <laughs> there were there was a few of us that were scheduled to do that ride, and and so we were trying to you know manage the logistics of getting from Sonora down to wherever the rip was going to be on that day. And as it turned out, Johnny Campbell, Ricky Nacho, and uh, Ramon. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all headed that direction. And, and uh, he's like, yeah, why don't you just ride down with us? This is Johnny Campbell. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. And it's like, yeah, I'll pay for gas. I mean, what do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy lunch, you know, whatever. Yeah. So it, it ended up working out. And at that time, my, my wrist was, um, you know, I finished out the last two days after I crashed on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And it, it honestly it didn't hurt that bad. And I thought, you know what, I'll just tape it up. We're going to go for it and just finish out the ride. <clears throat> See, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. That is some tough stuff there because I know it's not uh, riding a dirt, like on a quad, you get a break. But, you know, there's not a lot of quad riders on this that listen to this. <laughs> But I'm, on a dirt bike, you don't get a break. Yeah. I, I'm sure I didn't do it any favors. Let's put it down. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the most engineering-minded tape job on that, it probably still 
didn't help. No. But it looked like a good time. I mean, the Rip to Cabo is always, you know, the, the pictures and the stuff that we see. I'm, of course, waiting for the video to come out and, and the coverage on that. So it's always a good time with that group. Um, Cameron Steele leads the Desert Assassins down there. And it's it's not a, a ride that you can sign up for or, you know, pay to go on or anything like that. It, it is an invitation only ride. And I was lucky enough, you know, this goes back to the off-road community mm-hmm. um, and racing in, in Baja and I started racing Baja in 2008. Mm-hmm. I raced the first, my first 1,000 as an alternate on a team, and and the next year I went back and did it with um, with another guy, and we did it as a two man team, which was a little bit insane, but we did. And our pre running was um, pretty limited. Anyway, long story short, I ran a, out of gas on the Diablo Dry Lake bed about. 11 miles from my planned pit Mm -hmm. and so I was just pushing my bike across the lake bed it was getting dark and um, Cameron Steele was out pre-running for the 1000 and came across me Mm -hmm. he and a couple other buggies and he pulled up he's hey you out of gas I'm like yeah he's like hey I got I got gas and I was riding a 302 stroke is what I was pre-running on he's like you got oil for that thing I'm like yeah I got oil he's like great so all I need is a splash. And he like filled me up with four and a half gallons of race gas. And, and we just, you know, ever since then we've kept in touch and he's invited me to cut him on the rip, you know, many years. And, and just last year, not, not this year, but the previous year was my first time to go down and, and uh, participate in that. Actually it was 2019 cause we didn't have one in 2020. So, um, but yeah, we've just been friends ever since. And I've done rip to the Rockies with him and a couple other rides and, and he's just, he's family and it's um he's he's family to anybody that knows him like that you know he'll give you the shirt off his back and he's just he's just good people and he's a good uh, ambassador of baja yeah i i don't know him personally but it's it's one of those people that it doesn't take a lot of looking around to see that 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 that's the way that he is yeah you know and, and, and really cares around the group and and i had heard the same thing that it was uh that that ride was most definitely uh uh, invite only, um, but that you could you could see, and it seems like the group's grown a bit, you know, from the first the first iterations of it or the first times that it happened. And then uh, he did the things like uh, what is it, the Trail of Missions as well. Right. That was on the Raptors, if I remember correctly. Correct. Yep, uh, that's the yeah. truck tour. The truck yep. tour. So that you know, pretty cool. So it's cool. Like he is definitely a uh, an ambassador, you know, to to Baja, and, and knows more than just the the typical. You know the typical stuff. You know he gets in there, he's you know elbows deep in in history and and stuff and places to go. So it's awesome to see. Very very much so. He knows he knows his way around. He knows all the trails down there, um, and he knows who made them. And he he pays homage to those people. He respects them. Um, he knows the locals. He knows what beaches to go on, um, what beaches not to go on. He knows when the turtles are running and when we, you know, there was the route that we had planned in 2019, um, had about a 50 mile section of beach in it. Um, but because of, there was a, um, (laughs) tropical storm or hurricane that came through right before we came down Mm -hmm. and it altered what the turtles did. And the locals reached out to him and told him, Hey, uh, stay off the beach in this area. So we got to that area, verified, yep, that's what's happened. They're running early. So we, we rerouted after riding all day. We rerouted around that section. And it took us, you know, two and a half, three hours to route around it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was never a question. It was like, this is what's the right thing to do. And this is what we're going to do. Yeah. That's awesome. That is definitely awesome. I mean, it, you know, it, it no greater example than, you know, we're trying to take care of the areas that you ride in, you know, and, and it's a different approach than what California does, where they just basically lock the gate. Right. You know, right. So it, that's that's very awesome. That a story I would have I, you know, I'm sure only a few people know that that story over there, but that that's really, really cool. So with that, I mean, you've you've done a couple of rides and all that and you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but uh, let's. I just found out High Desert Adventures. What's what's that about? High Desert Adventures is a company that a buddy of mine, Greg Munn, started out of Prineville, Oregon. Mm-hmm. So over in Central Oregon, real close to Bend. Mm-hmm. He started the company in 2006 or seven, and um, asked me to come along as a guide to help um, 
ride some trail and visit the different towns of central Oregon. Okay. And he was interested in doing point to point tours, um, and, and, um, loops. So we first started just doing like a three day tour out of Prineville, go to Silver Lake, um, and make a loop from there up to Christmas Valley and come back. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, you know, typically 450, 500 miles over three days. Not, not an easy ride, not difficult technically, but just a good number of miles. And um, so he, he did that for a while, and I'd help him out when, he, when I could. And then he started going to Baja. And he went to Baja the first time in 2008, and that was the first year that I raced down there. And I came down early. I was pre-running, and he, he put together and called it Ride 1000 to Watch the 1000. And what a great idea. You go down and ride three or four days, stop somewhere on the course, take a group of guys, watch the race go by, drink some beers, have some you know chips and salsa, guacamole, whatever, tacos. And, and when you get tired of that, go back to the hotel, jump in the pool, whatever, and then get back on the bike the next day and finish out the loop. And so I did that a couple of years with him. And, and in 2013, he said, you know, I'm kind of getting burned out. I think I'm going to sell the business. And I said, you know, I was kind of thinking about doing something like this. Mm-hmm. He said, really? And I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't we, why don't you become my partner? So we partnered for three years, three and a half, four years, um, with high desert adventures and, and really kind of just honed the, the routes in central Oregon. Um, we have a wild west tour. We have, a. A ghost and um, Steens tour, where they go to the old ghost towns out there and stay in cool old hotels that nobody hardly knows about, ride routes that nobody knows about. Um, and the cool thing is, is, over that seven years, we worked with the Forest Service, three different Forest Service, and the BLM mm-hmm. to become the first permitted guide service, motorcycle guide service in Oregon. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, so that, that happened and, um, and that's how it tied into that rally school out there in central Oregon is it took a small portion of the routes that we normally ride and, and was able to use the same permit for that with their permission. Gotcha. So yeah, now we go to Baja twice a year. We typically go in the fall around the time of the 1000, do the same tour, ride 1000 to watch the 1000. And then in the, in the spring, usually February or March this coming year, it's going to be February. Uh, we ride from Ensenada to Cabo and, um, yeah, just have a great time. Nice. And what, um, so tell me a little bit. So skinny, skinny dirt bikes. I mean, is this an adventure bike thing? I mean, what, what's the, the niche there or what's the, you know, we will, we will custom tailor a tour to any group. Typically the, the ride in February is reserved for B plus level riders and above because of the, the technicality of the single track that we ride and the duration of the ride, okay. you know, over, over eight days we're riding, you know, between 1300 and 1550 miles. Um, so it's, it's not something for a beginner rider to do. In mm-hmm. fact, um, we won't take somebody down there that we haven't personally ridden with and, and spent time with to not only gauge their ability as a rider, but also to kind of check their personality because <laughs> yeah. you, you really don't want to get stuck with somebody in the group that has trouble getting along or, you know, has some weird, you know, issue that, nobody else could figure out without spending some time with them. So mm-hmm. we'll go out and we'll spend a, you know, a Saturday or a Sunday we'll go ride central Oregon or I'll go down and meet somebody in California, go ride out there and, you know, wherever it happens to be just to, to get some miles under the belt and uh, spend some time with the individual before we go. Nice. Yeah. And that, um, it, it's interesting because I, I've thought about that and I, I'm thinking about it now, right? I've got my, my seven ninety my suspensions back. So I'm getting ready to put that back together. Alex, Alex sent it back and, I'm excited. And then I'm like, okay, well, you know, I want to organize some rides. But then we think about like, okay, well, um, you'll probably be familiar with the area like Laguna Hansen to get to from Takata to Laguna Hansen. Sure. Um, some of that stuff, you know, there's the hard pack, but as you get closer, it starts getting kind of sandy. And most right. of the stuff, the, the most of the people that I know ride adventure bikes and sand and adventure bikes are an interesting topic. You know, some, yep. some people are confident in the sand and they know, you know, kind of what to do. And others are petrified of it. I mean, they're just like, no, I, right. 
I will ride a hundred miles out of the way just to avoid this. And so right. the same exact thing, what you're saying, you know, kind of comes to mind. It's like, okay, well, you need to have a way of kind of qualifying them. I and it's not that you're trying to eliminate them on purpose, but you're just trying to see that, hey, you know what? This is going to be a challenge. 1,500 miles. I mean, the peninsula is 10,000 or 1,073, 1,063 right. miles on the highway. So you're still finding another almost 400 miles of dirt on top of that. Right. You know? So it, it yeah. is a challenge. Yeah, you know, we cross the peninsula at least two, if not three times on most, you know, most occasions. And, you know, so I'll tell people, they ask the same question, what bike can I bring in? You know, typically guys have a couple different options. And, you know, for Baja down there, for what we're riding, um, you know, uh, uh, a 350 uh, XCF or EXC is a great choice if you're a KTM guy, you know, whatever. Uh, 450 is a great bike. The 501 is a phenomenal bike for down there. Any of those are good options. I've had a few riders come down on, on 690s mm-hmm. and absolutely kill it and loved it and didn't have any issues. But they were you know, they're double a rider, <laughs> their, their talent. They, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like Ricky Bryback, you know, making the rally bike look like a one fifty. He just, yeah. he just does. And there are people that have that talent and there are people that do not. So, you know, and it, we, we do, um, our, our tours are all about making it easy on you, the rider. Mm-hmm. We don't want you packing a lot of gear, um, pack a minimal amount of tools. We have, uh, in addition to a lead rider and a sweep rider, <clears throat> we have uh, a couple medics riding with us. We have a couple mechanics riding with us. Mm-hmm. And they pack the majority of the tools and things that you might need. Um, so we try to get, tell guys, you know, pack light, only bring what you need to in your pack. You know, pack your water bladder. Don't pack the small one. Bring the three liter water bladder. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure you got enough fuel. Four gallon tank is kind of the minimum. We're going to go 150 miles before we find fuel again if it's a remote area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we, we encourage guys to pack light and try to just have fun and relax and enjoy the, enjoy the time on the bike. And usually the chase truck will meet us for lunch and, and we'll have your, your gear bag and your duffel bag with your, all your toiletries and your personal clothing and all that stuff is there waiting for you at your hotel room when you roll in. Nice. So it's, you know, full service and, and then full, fully supported too. Fully supported. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I know is nice because you, uh, at least knowing from the adventure bike side of it, if you start thinking, okay, well, nobody's following me, so I need to be self-sufficient. Uh, that bike gets heavy really fast, right? Really, really fast. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, so that that is definitely an advantage. You know, having that much that much crew uh, to support it. And, and do you limit? Do you guys kind of limit the number of uh, of riders that you have? I mean, what's what's a group size for you guys? You know, a typical group size is between twelve and eighteen riders. Okay. Um, the last trip down in February that we did, we had eighteen riders total, and and that's kind of my limit. Mm-hmm. It's it's a limit for a few reasons. Um, moving more than that down the peninsula is is well, even that amount, it's a challenge. It's a logistic challenge, in that a lot of the hotels and you know places that you go to find accommodations they don't have much more room than that. (laughs) At least, you know, the places that we like to stay that we built relationships with, Mm -hmm. you know, 18, 20 people, that's kind of their max. So you add in a few crew, you know, chase truck drivers and stuff like that. And you're, you're pretty much uh, maxing out a couple of the hotels that we like to stay at. So, um, yeah. Well, and it's always good. I I like that, that, you know, you're building relationships with the hotels and it's in the same, the kind of the same spots. So, they know you, they know their expectations, they know, you know, they know the group and it's obviously it's business for them, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. So, so cool. So you do. So, OK, so that's you have a peninsula run and then you guys do a shorter one. Or? We do a loop in the fall, uh, okay. like I said, to watch the 1000. So, gotcha. you know, and we'll take we'll take more time on the Pacific side typically and, and try to get gobble up as much single track as we can. Um, start right out of La Bufa Dora and head head south. Um, nice. and, you know, through here and Dara and on down to, um, oh goodness. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. San Vicente, Pirates Cove, all that area. 
Yeah, we end up um, landing at. Um, oh, my goodness! I'm drawing a blank. I must have hit my head when I crashed. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of the old mills down there. The yep, kind of that's where we. That's where we go. We end up in at old old mill. Gotcha. Javier Javier takes great care of us. Nice. Um, so it's it's a good time, and then on down to Catavina, and then. Depending on where the race is going, what side of the peninsula it's headed down on, if it's a loop or not, you know, we'll we'll go from there to find a good spot to watch. Gotcha. And Catavina is such a horrible place to ride to. I don't even know why you would take people down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, don't ever go down there. If you guys are listening, don't ever go down there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's awful. <laughs> no, I know. It, yeah, at least without – don't go out down there without a guide. It, it really gets sparse after Catavina. So um, I know Cameron and his crew re- refer to it as the never, never. You're never going to see anybody else. You're never going to get cell coverage. Um, you'll likely not find a gas station. Uh, so it, it's it's a place you go beyond that point. You better know what you're doing and you better have a plan, a backup plan. We call it plan A, B, C, D, E, and F. And you hope that you never get to F. Yeah. <laughs> I I would completely agree with that, and I, and yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll re- rewind. Yes, it's a great area. Yes, riding, but it is a nationally protected area. It is. It you know, it's not one of those places that you just you know you get free reign of it. Um, but exactly what you're saying. This is it's not something that you would just you know fly from across the ocean just to go ride that area without knowing you know what you're doing because yeah, it gets dangerous really quick. Um, even, uh, what was it, uh, Baja Rally this past year? I rode my 790 down and I basically did the whole, um, it really wasn't the rally. It was just kind of a, we ended up making it kind of like a private event, but, um, just riding to Catavina and back and then into one of the sections, I almost ran, like, I literally rolled into, uh, Rosario on fumes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I, and I was just like, I know better. I, you know, I know better than this and it hot day, you know, every, everything sucked, but I, you know, stupid to say, and I've been down there enough times to know that. And, you know, all it took was one stupid decision, you know, don't splash. And that's what, you know, so if you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you down there in that area, you really, really have to know, you have to know what's going on. Yeah. But the sunsets down there are absolutely amazing. Oh, they, they're really hard to be beat. Um, some of my favorites are out of um, Gonzaga Bay. Gonzaga Bay and L.A. Bay have just phenomenal um, sunrise and sunsets. It's it's uh, something you'll never forget if you get the opportunity. And I know you've been down there, so you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We did, uh, we did a ride out of uh, San Diego BMW Motorcycles when I worked there. We, we left there at, I think it was like 7 in the morning and ro- rode straight to Catavina. And the whole time I was like, you know, hey, let's stop here. Let's go. No, we have to be in Catavina for sunset. There's no stopping. (laughs) Like, you know, right. And power through it. And yeah, and it's absolutely. And it's like the land of, uh, you know, talking to some of the other guys. It's like Dr. Seuss land. The bosom trees that are down there are like incredible. Yeah. And they're right. It's like literally they're right out of a Dr. Seuss book. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's just an amazing. It, it is it is an amazing area. If that you know you're you're going down there and staying on that loop, I think that's you know anybody listening to that that's been thinking of doing a tour, yeah, they need to look up uh need to look up your website and get in on that because it is it is awesome. So so northern routes. So somewhere I've never been to. I know Baja. I know nothing of Oregon and riding up there. What's uh what's the riding like up there? Where where do you guys go? What's the I know you mentioned some ghost towns. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've had other guys ask me, what's it like riding in central Oregon? And, you know, I grew up in the Mojave desert in Lancaster, California, um, could ride right out of my garage. Well, push right out of my garage. My dad had made me push it the two or three blocks it took me to get to the desert. But, uh, anyway, it's, it's kind of similar to that in, in the terrain, there's a little bit more pumice stone in the, in the in the earth, and it's a lot greener. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and there, and there's virtually no cactus. Um, uh, replace your cactus with uh, sagebrush and 
And as you get up in elevation, you'll get up into the pine trees and, and that's where it's, it's really fun. You know, we have, um, we have some really good routes that go up above Silver Lake and um, uh, up to Fremont Point and just, you know, overlooking uh, the scenery up there um, is phenomenal. Look down on Summer Lake and um, Silver Lake and the, and the vistas are just, they're hard to beat. They're, you know, and I would put them right on par with the, with the views and stuff that you find, you find down in Baja. And, and what makes them special is that you don't see anyone else out there. You see a lot of farmland. You see a lot of just um, desert that has been, um, it's unmolested. You know, it's, it's in its original form from hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I, I brought a group. <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. I, I brought a group from New York, you know, mm-hmm. six guys. And, and those are hard to judge because you talk to them on the phone and, you know, what's your riding experience? Oh, I've been riding since I was 16. Yes. And, and this and that. Okay. And you, so this is the plan. We're going to ride, you know, 125 to 160 miles a day over three days. Oh, is that it? Is that all? Anyway, fast fast forward to day one, and we're, you know, 65, 70 miles into the ride, and they're asking for mommy. <laughs> <laughs> is there any way that we can – where are we? How far is the highway from here? Can we can we get to the road, ride the road in? And, and literally, we were probably a mile to a mile and a half from a major highway. Uh, no, nope, it's nowhere to be found. This is our route. This is what we got to do, <laughs> you know. And and the writing was not. It's not terribly technical. It's a lot of two track. It's a lot of old wagon road. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we made it into Silver Lake, and we stay in a little cabin out there that nobody knows about. And uh, we got in, and you know, they're like, Ace, thanks for pushing us through this. If we had ridden the road and missed that last, you know, eighty five miles. We would have never, you know, we would have never known what we missed, number one. But knowing what it is now, we would have been pissed. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it's, um, there's just a lot to see out there. And it's kind of the Wild West that, you know, especially people coming from New York or San Francisco, L.A., anywhere where they're gridlocked with concrete. Mm -hmm. And they get out there into the, the open desert and... You know, just kind of get that feeling and that smell in the air of of nature at its purest. They're like, this was worth the trip. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at uh, I I just jumped on uh, on the Google and I'm looking at pictures of the area and just some of the scenic stuff that's there. And wow, you know, yeah. I yeah. I picture when I picture Oregon, I always think of just trees and trees and palm trees and more trees. But um, looking at this area, yeah, it's like kind of like prairie grassland and. and I'm looking at the right place. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it does look, look amazing. And what's, uh, maybe this might play a factor into, but what's the altitude in those areas? Do you, do you recall? Yeah, absolutely. So bend is about just under 3000 foot. Okay. And, um, we go up and down from there. So that's kind of your base. We, we can get up into the sisters mountains a little bit. Mm-hmm. We get up into the mountains above bend, um, Silver Lake is probably a little bit less in elevation. I think it's around 23 to 2,700. Um, but now you're getting into further, you know, central and eastern Oregon. And as you go further east, it gets colder. So the winters are pretty brutal out there. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so it's not that bad. So I was I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, yeah, maybe the elevation kind of plays into it. Because, yeah, elevation will will definitely level somebody out. But no, two 3,000 feet isn't bad. No. Yeah, so, but yeah, uh, winter. Yeah, they can keep the cold. I'm, I'm, I'm a fair weather rider. <laughs> All the first tone up to that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, we start doing tours in Central Oregon in May, and we usually stop at the end of September, early October. If you know, if we have somebody that really wants to go in October, we'll, we'll try it. But it's, it can, it can get interesting. We've been snowed on a time or two. <laughs> So, and, and the same with May. I mean, if you go uh, first weekend of May, you're probably going to hit snow as we get into some of the upper, um, 
uh, elevations of the Fremont Forest and, and Bend, you know, riding through Bend, you get up into some elevation out at China Hat. So we'll, we usually hit some snow, but it, it's always fun trying to make our way around it. And it's a, it's a topic of conversation at dinner, you know, when we get to where we're going. So it's mm-hmm. all good. Nice. And those are, and they're the same, right? Doing about four or 500 miles, you said? Yeah, we have a, a three day tour. We've got a five day tour, um, and, and we can customize any of those. Right. You know, all, all the routes are pretty much set, and uh, we can we can link them together or do them separately, however you want to do it. And that's kind of cool because I think you know if I, our relationship with the Forest Service and the BLM continues as it has been for the last uh, nine years. Um, I think it's looking promising as I learn to build road books that we may have a rally out there someday. Uh Oh, now we're getting serious. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Nice. Well, and, and so you have, do you have a fair bit of it already road booked out or, or is this is just something you're starting to get into? Well, we're kind of re getting into it. Right. Oh, gotcha. So, um, <laughs> Alex and I, when he was talking about doing a school, we first started out on a pretty big scale trying to do one of the routes that I already had, you know, um, logged. Um, but it would have been a point to point school. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, we kind of scrapped that idea, but we kept some of the books that we built back then, Mm -hmm. you know, a few of the stages. So he's got those and, and, um, he probably won't mind me saying, but he's he's been working on additional stuff out there just via Google Earth and flying it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, you know, with the two of us, um, what I have and what he has and putting our brains together, I think we're going to be able to put together a, a really cool four, three or four day event that would be um, that would attract some um, some talent, I think. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, and that's, you know, and it's practice for a lot of these guys. So that's how they, you know, that that's how they see it. And then obviously in, in the, the scenery and everything that's there and then you get more people interested. And so, yeah, it's, it's awesome because that's what we need, you know, <laughs> if we yeah, want to go and, to the sport, you know, I think, you know, there is precedent out there already in, in, um, China hat area. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do an ISDE out there. Um, uh, there's a motorcycle club that puts out an event out there and it's been going on for 30 plus years. It's a competitive ISDE style event. Um, and it covers generally anywhere from 90 to 120 miles. So, and it's, that is all competitive at speed event. Um, so I think it, but it's, it's insured by the AMA, uh, and their underwriters as a recreational event. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can go at it under the same premise, a recreational event, Mm -hmm. uh, yet have some competitive timed stages or sections, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's totally doable. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, I, I don't know all the legalities of, you know, how they how the AMA may sanction an event like that. You know, it's not something that I really delve into yet. Yes. Um, but the my biggest thing with rally is and will always be is like spectators. That's it. I mean, you do, you if if the idea is the only thing you're really looking after at that point now is just um, is the rider themselves. And then, you know, the any kind of maybe damages that they may do to infrastructure or something along those lines but rally raid rally racers generally tend to be a different mentality mindset you know it's they got other stuff going on it's not just how fast can i go through this section exactly no and that's what i think will make it doable um there there aren't a lot of spectators for rally right um and that's that's what keeps it um the scope of it mild but the, you've got the support crew mm-hmm. um you've got all of the people putting on the event and it's basically a traveling circus you know as you you know go from one town to the next putting up a bivouac mm-hmm. um and that's that's what these small towns central oregon eastern oregon are craving they are they are on fumes as far as um you know economy and and you know, feeding their families, those, the, you know, everything out there is, um, just on the verge of collapse. So there, any hint of bringing riders through, um, 
they are all for it. They're all for it. You know, I was just calling around, checking in with some of my contacts this year Mm -hmm. to see if, you know, you guys open for business. Can I bring a group through? You know, absolutely. We're ready. Bring them. You know, there's no hesitation. And there was the same thing in Baja when we went down in in February. Mm -hmm. We were super nervous about going down there. You know, I have so much respect for the people of Baja and, and, and love them so much that the last thing I wanted to do was bring a group of riders down there and, and bring COVID into some of these, you know, small villages or something. Yeah. So we had a, a really heart to heart conversation with every place that we were to visit. Um, and, and every one of them were, Ace, bring them. We're ready. We're ready. You know, you have the whole hotel to yourself. You know, exposure is going to be minimal. We'll wear masks. We'll distance. And they didn't have any um, hesitancy of us coming down. But, you know, we did our own protocol, you know, testing in advance of going down and and checking temperatures each day. And, you know, Mm -hmm. by that time, some people uh, had just started getting vaccines. And so, you know, we we tried to make it as safe as possible. And fortunately, we took with all the crew and everybody and, and family coming to meet us at the end, there was, I think 38 people went down, 38 people came back and everybody was tested when they came back and everybody was negative. So we felt pretty good at it, about it at the end, but yeah, anyway, kind of got off topic there. No, no, no. But I mean, that's, and, and it's a very valid point because this thing obviously isn't going away. I mean, it's either new variations of it or whatever, or even, okay, erase the whole COVID thing. And I'm, I don't mean to say that in dismissive, in a dismissive fashion, but you know, this is stuff that it's almost like basic manners and like, yeah, when you go to a place, you know, be clean, you know, respect people's distance, wash your hands, you know, do all the things that they told you as a kid, you know, get your hands out of your mouth, get your hands out of your face, you know, da, 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 all this stuff. So this, I think is whether COVID was around or not, it's still good practice and it's still stuff that, you know, shows respect to the people that are there, you know, because it's just as easy, you know, cold, you know, with medical resources and stuff down there, uh, sometimes it's not easy to just, you know, oh, I've got a really bad cold or I've got a really bad flu or whatever. It can escalate, you know, and something here where it's, you're going to go sit in the emergency room for six and a half hours. They don't have that ability there, even that right. as, as it is here. So, yep. you know, that that's awesome. And, you know, and that shows, you know, taking responsibility for it and not just going like, eh, whatever, you know. Right. Right. So, because I did, you know, unfortunately, I did see posts like that, and people thought like, "Oh, well, you know, it's Mexico, whatever, we'll do what we want." And it's like, nah, it shouldn't be that way. Right. You know, we're still guests of the country. So, but that, but you know, on another, it's awesome to see, you know, checking in and that the that the hotels and the the, the places that you guys visit in both areas, um, you know, Oregon and Baja, you know, are, are are looking for the business. They're ready to go. You know, they're doing what they can, and then that's that's good. Definitely. Yeah. So, so when's, uh, so let's see, where are we at right now? So I know we've got Baja Rally coming up in September. Coda Rally also is mid September. Um, where are you guys at for rides? I mean, do you already have rides on the calendar still for the remainder of the year? You know, we, we do. Um, we're open if somebody wants to put together a, a group and, and come out to Oregon. We're, we're ready and, and taking reservations. Um, we didn't list any rides on our, our website this year except for the two Baja tours that we have coming up. Gotcha. Um, just, just because people are still pretty uh, anxious about traveling right now. So, mm-hmm. um, we figured if we did anything in Oregon, we'll, we'll customize it to whatever people want. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the routes in Baja are already set and they're not changing. So, um, yeah. Well, that's good. So, I mean, it's so it's open, open to do the stuff here in Oregon. And then like you said, in Baja, and I mean, I would imagine it's kind of the same thing, you know, like anything else. Like, hey, just check the temperatures and, you know, just do some basics, you know, nothing, nothing super fancy. And, Right, and we can still do it, and so that would be nice because I don't like you said. I'm sure, I'm sure the companies or the the restaurants and the hotels and stuff that you guys visit could, I'm sure, could use a business. Yeah, exactly. That'd be pretty cool, and and so that is, if I remember, so that basically would run through summer that window. Correct. Yeah, through September, basically. Gotcha. Yep. Nice. And so, all right. So, what's next for you in the in the world of rally? 
You know, I, I'm really interested in um, jumping on the Coder Rally. I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> I just had another x-ray, and I'm waiting on the results there. Spent sending it off to a specialist just to make sure I didn't get that navicular bone in your wrist. You know, and that's that's where my little bit of pain is coming from. It's not getting any better, so uh, they're going to have a specialist look at it and uh, see what that says. But if, if all is green there and I can... And take this brace off and get back to riding. Then I really want to do the Coda Rally, mm-hmm. um, and then Baja Baja Rally is on the on the books for the fall, mm-hmm. and then uh, get ready for Sonora twenty twenty two. Nice. <laughs> that one is. I think that uh, well, it would be interesting to see because I'm sure the dates will probably change and it'll probably forward it or or make it a little earlier. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that was hot. Yeah. It was a scorcher. Yes. Um, Day four, day four on the bike through the, that was the kind of the dune marathon stage. I, I don't know the total mileage of the dunes. It was w- around 150 for the day um, is my guess. But man, it was, I think uh, they had six or seven aid stations set up across the dunes. And I hit probably five of them just to get water dumped over the, you know, down the neck, down the body, <laughs> get the uh, swamp cooler rolling a little bit. Yeah, it was hot. It was. I think it was um, at the fuel stop out there. Uh, one of the guys that was out there said it was 105 degrees, and that's that's cooking on the sand. Uh, yeah, it's reflecting back up. It's bright. It's hot, and then you know, then you get to the the. I heard there were there were some sick, <laughs> some. How should we put that? There's some uh, king of the hill waypoints. Uh, the yeah, very tippy tippy top of that. <laughs> yeah. So you're not going fast. You know, you get to the point where you're just running out of steam. So I can only imagine that it was a handful. They were some. Uh, <laughs> there was some good placement on those. I was kind of you know, it, you know, you you get to know. Um, the bookmakers a little bit as you ride these different road books. Mm -hmm. And I haven't ridden a lot. I've ridden, you know, Scott Bright's I've ridden Arley Dave's and, um, of course, um, with Sonora rally, uh, Skelton's, but you you get to know them and you, I was thinking back to 2019 and I don't, I don't remember some of those being placed like they were in 2021. (laughs) And, (laughs) Yeah, you look at that hill and you're looking at your book and, okay, your Odo says this and you've got, you know, the waypoint says it's six tenths of a mile or a kilometer. And, and, uh, that could be the top of that dune. And you're, all right, I guess we're going up this one, you know, and, uh, away you go. And, and uh, there was a couple of them that the dune peaked and then it was, there was another dune with a ridge going, um, kind of parallel to the to the one you just climbed Mm -hmm. so kind of a false front Mm -hmm. if you will and you had to go up a little bit more and get over that one to find the waypoint a couple of them caught me off guard for sure yeah well i think that was i don't remember if it was that day they kind of blurred together right in the middle um i think it was that day that every nobody came back with a smile on their face Nobody yeah, was, that day, yeah. that was brutal. Yeah. I, I came in in my, you know, my rear wheel. I was, I was kind of hopping along as I came down the pavement into the, into the bivouac. And, you know, we started out, um, everybody starts out with fresh tires, fresh moose, you know, all that stuff. And, and when I got done with Sonora Rally in 19, my mooses were still pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, Rally Pan Am, that team does a great job of checking everything out. And, and even if you destroy it, they'll rebuild it for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, they didn't change my moose that night. And they, I felt it when I got on the bike Thursday morning. It felt fine. And when I got done, that moose was absolutely destroyed. There was you know, basically a groove around the entire moon. They pulled it out. And they said, you got to come look at this. I'm like, holy cow, what happened there? <laughs> the The rim lock was was melted to the tire. It was oh, wow. you know, basically just peeled off. When they peeled off the tire, it was the tire got very, very, very hot. I was going to say, it sounds like it got a little warm. Yeah. But, man. But, I mean, yeah, it, it made it the adequate amount, the, like, not a, not another kilometer. <laughs> it probably would have really came apart. Yeah. Uh, that That is crazy. And so that, uh, so toughest day for sure then for you. 
at, at Sonora. Yeah, I think that was one of the toughest days uh, racing on a motorcycle. It was, you know, just, yeah, the heat and the terrain and uh, the direct sun, it was just all, all of it combined made for a super difficult day. And the, and the navigation was not easy. Um, it was some difficult navigation. In fact, I caught, uh, I don't know, there was a group of four or five riders in front of me, and you, you kind of see them off in the distance and, a couple of them were doing circles and I kind of, I paused, stopped and paused on a dune and watched them for a sec, looked at my road book and I saw pretty quickly where they'd missed the turn. Mm -hmm. And I could see other tracks from the riders ahead of them had turned before the dune that they had gone up and over. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was able to kind of sneak down the dune and <laughs> find the right track and get on my way and, you know, hopefully put some time on some of my competitors. But, you know, that's, that's the cool thing about rallying. You don't, you don't always have to be the fastest guy in the, in the pack to, you know, finish well. So yeah, that was, but it was a tough day back to your, back to your point. It was just, yeah, the weather and, uh, it being mostly a sand dune day, it was just, Endless up and down, up and down, up and down sand dunes. No. I can't imagine. And yeah, not <laughs> checking that one off my list. I think I'll just go ahead and stick to what I was doing and stay in the bivouac and greet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Never hurts yeah. to try. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, it was definitely not going to be a 790 unless it's the one the Rottweiler built. But yeah, even then, I don't have the talent to get it out of second gear. So I'm not kidding myself. The so. I mean, yeah, the navigation being difficult, tough days and, and stuff like that. So for for a bit, you know, this this show I and mean, kind of what I've been trying, obviously, is getting people into the sport and, and into rally and get them into navigation. So my question to you is, are there some things that you some of those aha moments as you were learning to navigate and, and doing stuff and, and, and getting into this that you want to share? I mean, that could help some people. Oh, every every time I get on the bike and and click on the navigation stuff, it's it's a learning experience for me. <laughs> I mean, so many people have helped me get started, and and I would consider myself still to be a novice. Which is, I'm like, I'm not sure why I'm here talking on the show, but I appreciate the time anyway. Um, I, I'd say get with the people that. Um, know their stuff, you know, go to a Jimmy Lewis school, go to a Scott Bright school, um, reach out to, uh, you know, the young guns that are coming up. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a serious, fast guy that's transitioning maybe from off-road and wants to give rally a try, reach out to those kids like Mason Klein and Jacob Augerbright and, you know, I don't know, you'll have access to the Ricky Brybecks and the Andrew Shorts of the world, but, you know, you show up at one of those schools and they show up to those too because they want the practice. Um, and there aren't a lot of road books out there to practice. So it, it's not uncommon. The last um, Scott Bright school that I went to, uh, Skyler and Andrew were both there. And they're just another um, another guy in the class. And they go out and they write the exact same road books that you do. And they're out there getting the same practice that you are. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that's the biggest thing is just get out there and find some people to practice with. Uh, find somebody that's, you know, getting into it and start making road books, you know, download that Rally Navigator program and, and you know, put together a, a, a loop, that a short loop that's maybe 30K. Go out and try it. See see if you can do it. See if you can follow your own, you know, markings and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you put together a route and and you think because you built the route, you'll know where it goes. No, <laughs> you, you can get lost on your own stuff just as fast as you can get lost on somebody else's stuff. So yeah, I can see it now. Wait, didn't you ride off into the sunset? Yeah. Uh huh. Who made the yep. route? Well, I did. Didn't you know yep. where you were going? <laughs> well, I thought I did. I thought and that's did. where you, and that's where you get messed up is when you think, you know, where you're going because either you a wrote the book or B you think, you know what the road book writer is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Or you see other tracks that um, uh, it's got to go that way because that's where the majority of the tracks go. If it doesn't happen on the book, then don't don't go there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, 
was a happy Dave that was talking about going to a Scott Bright school and going out and messing up at the same point. I eventually, I remember Scott sending him out and said, write it backwards Mm -hmm. and find the mistake that way. And he did. He was like, ah, uh uh-huh. I found it. Now I know. Um, I remember that spot and it took me three tries. I went, I'd get to the spot where I'd screw up because there was tracks. There was tracks about five, five tenths of a K before the actual turn. Mm -hmm. And it had been a while since there was, um, an action to do in the road book. So you begin to wonder, you know, is my mileage off is, you know, is my odometer off just a little bit? That would make sense. This turn makes sense. Everything matches as far as the landscape is concerned. And I can't tell you how many times I've said that running gnarly Davis routes, everything lined up. Yeah. (laughs) Until it didn't. And then then you make the turn and then you keep going and you're like, oh, yeah, I made a mistake somewhere. But in that case, the the one that Happy Dave was talking about, I went back and and got to the, the, we rode between two very large rock formations. And at that point, you could reset your Odo. And I did it like three times. Mm -hmm. Well, some, what I learned on that occasion is sometimes the books are off. It's not your Odo. It's the books that are off just slightly because they're building it via satellite, right? Um, most of the time. Mm-hmm. And then it's usually verified with a you know somebody that rides the route and makes corrections. But sometimes those corrections, you might miss just one. So go another two tenths, three tenths of a kilometer and find the actual turn. And when you do, you're like, ah, there it is. Got it. There, it's... It's the game. <laughs> I mean, I guess well, that's, that's the way to put it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not an exact science. I mm-hmm. mean, most of the time, 99% of the time, you can ride to the number on the book and mm-hmm. your action's going to take place at that point. Mm-hmm. Where it becomes a less exact science is when you go off piece and you're following a cap heading. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're on the cap heading for. 70% of the time and the other 20, 30% of the time you're off by a degree or two. At some point, it you have to make up that variance mm-hmm. or look for it in the, you know, in the distance. Like it, so then it becomes more of an art than an exact science. And I think, you know, that combined with the marathon aspect of the game is what really, you know, just drags me into it even more. Yeah, and it, it, it's the very same, the very same thing that that levels the playing field, and that will never give a flat out outright advantage to somebody that has all the factoring backing and no practice. Right, you and won't. and the thing that they're doing to make it even more so is is giving you the road book the day before or the uh, the morning of instead of the day before, mm-hmm. and and you know, um, prior event, you know, back, back up to 2019 snow rally, you get the, the road book the night before they still did that for the first two or three stages of this time. But then they started giving us the book the day of, or the morning of, um, and that, that just makes everybody viewing the same road book the same way, mm-hmm. um, with not a lot of time to study it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it you finally achieve, that almost like one of the last levels of uh, not giving the advantage to somebody and, and yeah. really, you know, equipment being equal and, and the varying, you know, this bike is better built because it's a more comfortable, carries more gas. It gives you an advantage in that sense, better wind protection, that kind of thing versus a bike. That's just like a rally light bike, right. That, you know, it's just got the bare minimum navigation equipment. There's going to be some differences there, but ultimately, no, neither one of them, I think, has a flat out, if you don't have this piece of equipment, you're not going to win or, you know, it's, it's going to be impossible to beat the other. It's all about the navigation. Right. So I think that's, you know, that that's, I think, why a lot of people, I think it's going to eventually draw more and more and more and more people because I know people that are that have raced the score races and it's basically it's always a race to the you know bottom top 5 or the you know the bottom part of the top 10 because you've got teams that go out do all of this homework know all the lines and all this stuff and good luck trying to catch them uh with the, some of the work that they put in you know and, and some of these lines and some of these things. right and it's it's not 
Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. And, and good for them for going out and doing their homework and and uh, marking their trail and their secret lines. And, you know, that takes effort. And um, anybody is open to do that. If you want to go down and race Baja, you can go down there and pre-run, pre-run, pre-run and basically memorize the course and, you know, um, find those those off the main line lines that are going to save you 10, 15, 20 seconds here and there. And, and that's what ends up ran, winning the races. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's the reason Johnny Campbell is an 11-time uh, overall tr- champion. Mm-hmm. Overall in, he beat everybody, including the trophy trucks, 11 times. And, and that was not from uh, lack of effort, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it was from him going down and putting in the work and doing his homework and spending the time pre-running for a month or more prior to the event. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just incredible. Yeah. And that, um, how do you say? So, yeah, not and not to discredit the homework and the stuff that they're, that they're doing, but it's just you've, you've now doubled that group in size. Right. You know, it's a great equalizer for the average rider. Mm -hmm. You know, the average rider that's going down to race Baja gets there three, four days, maybe a week before the race to Mm -hmm. pre-run. And they might get in three or four runs on the, on the section that they're scheduled to run. The factory guys are spending weeks down there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I I like the idea of getting the road book the morning of, and Mm -hmm. it, it just levels the playing field. I, I definitely uh, agree with that. And then I, there's other stuff that I've seen, like, you know, not including the starts and the finishes and stuff, certain liaison, certain sections, you know, at the beginning or the end of the road book in order to prevent, you know, even if you did get it a little bit ahead of time to have anybody uh, uh, try and fly it and recreate it and that kind of stuff. So it's uh, I'm glad that the organizations are taking that seriously. Um, and even now, I mean, what do you think about um the electronic roadbook thing. We got to see a few guys now on the Tower One down at Sonora. What are your thoughts on that? I got to run one. So I had um, one of the Ico Tower Ones mm-hmm. on my bike, and I I was impressed. Um, it's super easy to use. It uses all the same, you know, switches and things like that. I, you know, Luke, Luke Bennett, who owns Ico and has been, you know, developing that for the last, you know, couple, two, three years. Cause it was, it was being piloted in 2019 at Sonora. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the only thing that they're still struggling with, and I don't know that it's any less of an issue than it is with a standard road book is the glare and the glare from the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the Tower One is is probably ten times brighter than any iPad out there, um, and and I never had, I won't say never. There was one or two occasions over five days that I glanced up at the roadbook and I couldn't see what I needed to see, and I had to change my position on the bike just to get a little bit different angle mm-hmm. to take a to take a second look, um, and it didn't it didn't affect my. I didn't miss a turn because of it or, or anything like that. So, you know, I was, I was pleasantly pleased (laughs) and pleasantly surprised at how good it worked. Um, it was super easy for him to come by, um, in the morning Mm -hmm. and all Bluetooth load the route for the day, any changes, any alterations to the course, um, that had been added or deleted or automatically, you know, taken care of. I didn't have to go in and paste any paper or make any cuts or anything like that. So it, it really simplified it for me. Mm-hmm. You know, why other guys were rolling their roll, you know, road book or their roll chart into their book. I was doing other stuff. I was hydrating. I was putting my, putting my stuff together. You know, it, it just wasn't something I had to worry about. So in that respect, I, I really like it. Yeah. And how so the and one of the premises there and a lot, I think there's an argument for it is that well you know marking the roadbook and it's a safety thing right I mark my roadbook a certain way so that I know that's you know uh, it, it draws my attention to it the digital roadbook and rally navigator basically auto coloring the notes and stuff like that how did you feel about that I mean did, 
<laughs> did you wish you had a chance to market? Like, no, did you honestly, it? honestly, it did a better job than I could have done if I had been handed my road book on the morning of. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't think I could have marked it as well. Gotcha. No, it, it did a, a good job. The colors were bright. Mm -hmm. It was super obvious. You know, the danger markings were super apparent. Um, the only thing that I seemed to mess up a couple times was the speed zones, um, but that was that's that's not a, a marking thing. Uh, maybe I would have, you know, made some hot hot pink or yellow stripes or something across the thing to draw my attention to it. But that's just I think that's a learning factor versus uh, an error. Gotcha. Just a little. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I could see. Yeah, I w I'm with you that I would have probably been a little bit more because uh, you know a speed zone. The trouble usually doesn't happen mid speed zone. The trouble no. happens at the beginning of it. And yeah, at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So if <laughs> if I you know look back to other rallies that I've done and uh, road books that I've ridden or whatever, if I if there's a speed zone. I, I do color the crap out of it. <laughs> so, you know, that it probably, maybe it made a difference. It wasn't a huge penalty for me. Well, mm -hmm. most of them were not. There was one, I, they docked me, I think. It was on the last day, and I had, I think I had three and a half hours over the next guy behind me, so it wasn't a big deal. But it was a 45-minute speeding penalty. <laughs> oh. uh, I came in hot, <laughs> and uh, I didn't notice that it was a speed zone for uh, a good period of time apparently yeah. well and, and it depends like as i there's there's different rules between the two between the two rallies sure and uh the the rally that you know that i worked with baja rally it's uh anywhere you go the speed zone is based the penalty is a exponential penalty so how many seconds versus how many kilometers above the speed you're going um, right. And then it, with Sonora Rally, it's a minute per uh, per two seconds, uh, and and I'm just quoting this from what I vaguely remember. So you know, it's not law, but there's a there's a certain penalty in the stage, and then there's a very aggressive penalty out of the state, out of the the selective stage, out of the timed right. portion of it, which I. I agree with it. I kind of like that because then, okay, well, it helps tighten stuff up in the during the stage part. But then when you really have absolutely no reason to be speeding whatsoever, it is very aggressive. Yeah. You know, and but it's still part of the game. You still got to watch out because the penalties count. And, you know, and obviously I know what you're trying, you know, like Darren did mention it. You know, the, the main thing is, is that we're trying to keep people from just, you know, turning it into a free for all and just taking a penalty just because, you know, so, right. yep. so, but yeah, but for those playing the home game, the trouble on speed zones is at the beginning, not mid or not the end. Well, maybe the end, if you jump the gun, if you jump the gun, <laughs> that could be problematic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's hard to do because it, it beeps at you. The rally comp such a cool device, you know, and it, um, as obnoxious as the buzzer is, it, it is, it, you, you really look for it and kind of anticipate when it's not only opening a waypoint for you or, or telling you the end of a speed zone is, you know, it's go time, you know? And so it's, it's, it's fun. It just, it's one more thing that adds to the fun. Yeah. And, and from, you know, setting my experience with the rally comp, uh, as far as riding goes has been, you know, setting up waypoints and, and doing some of the testing for the other functions of the W or of the, the rally comp and, and just the, Okay, I know I put this waypoint here on this road, and it should be coming up. And then it, you know, the, then the thing goes off. And it's like, Dee -dee. I'm like, all right, perfect. Now we're in business. Right. I yeah. can only imagine how much more exponential that feeling is when you're in the middle of nowhere. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's it's precise too. I, I you know I think back to 2019. And we came up to a road crossing and, and for safety reasons, for those, you know, like you say, playing the home game for safety reasons, when you cross a major road, they make you stop before you get to the road. And sometimes they'll put a waypoint there and the waypoint, let's say is, is 300 meters circle. And you may come up to that road from a variety of different 
angles or trails, depending on, you know, if it's an off-piece section. Mm -hmm. Um, And in this particular case, it was. And we came up to the road, and another rider was stopped at the same point, and I pulled up to the right of him, off maybe, you know, eight or ten feet to his right. And I watched his thing. His thing counted down. He was watching it and counted down five, four, three, two, one, go. And he took off. And mine didn't register. And being my first rally, I thought, well, this thing's broke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just not registering. Mm-hmm. What I should have done is ride parallel to the road until I found the waypoint. But I wasn't savvy enough, you know, two years ago, I wasn't savvy enough to know that. And I just continued on. Well, if you don't hit the waypoint and clear it, it doesn't, it, it thinks you missed it. Mm-hmm. And, and you did most, of, you know, 99.999% of the time. If you talk to, talk to Mike Johnson, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mess up. <laughs> Either you hit it or you didn't. Yeah. So fast forward later that night, I get to the bivouac and it says that I've missed all these waypoints and I've got all these penalties. I'm like, I swear I hate every single one of them. And so they, they have a, a GPS log that they can go look at on the computer, and you also carry a tracking device on your person, and they use that, and they overlay the two, and they can pretty much tell that you hit all the spots. And, but he mm-hmm. pulled up that one in particular, and he says, you missed it by six feet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were that far outside that. I said, okay, that explains it. That's why that guy got it, and I didn't. And he goes, yeah, you, didn't you ride up and down the road? I'm like, no, I didn't know I could do that or should do that. So, you know, you just, you learn all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a constant, constant learning curve. But I mean, once you get like, once you learn the rules of the game and, and, and what to look for, it's, and, and I saw it in Baja Rally over the years, it's like the guys that we ended up handing some gnarly missed waypoint penalties to by the very next stage had it roped in, you know, <laughs> after that, after a couple of those, it was like, there was never another issue with it again. They understood that, you know, Hey, okay, I know I'm here, but I need to make sure the rally comp is here where it needs to be at that waypoint. And then like what you said in your example, it's six feet to the left. That's all it took. Right. I mean, there's a radius associated with each waypoint. And if exactly. you're outside of that radius, you're outside of that radius. And yep. so, that's crazy. All right. So we're kind of wrapping it up. But um, all right. So if we want to know more about High Desert Adventures and, and more about your your racing and your adventures, where uh, where can we find you? Yeah. I, HighDesertAdventures.net for all the tour stuff and to check out the rides that we've done in the past. Um, we kind of just did a relaunch of our website this year. So um, there's not a lot of old content on there. But um and the, the trip from February is on there and a bunch of cool videos. Um, SRS creative Jubal Brown came along. He's also a rally guy um, that does uh, social media and, and marketing and stuff like that. We brought him along and he just did a bang up job for us and captured a lot of cool stuff and put it out there in a bunch of short videos. So that that's one place to go. And um, you know, I'm not a huge like I said, uh, I'm an older guy and not, not huge into the social media, but uh, we do have a, a Instagram account and a Facebook account for High Desert Adventures. And um, you can follow along there too. Same, same nomenclature. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll get, uh, I'll do some, uh, some scavenging. And uh, I know I, I follow already the account. So I'll, uh, I'll include the links on the podcast. So uh, awesome. down in the description. So people can, people can find you and catch you out there. And, uh, hopefully get some tours. I'm, I'm, I'm getting curious of this Oregon thing. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a fun place to come ride. The temperatures in the summertime are usually a nice escape from those of the Southern California, Arizona, Nevada deserts. Um, and it's, it's kind of a treat. Nice. Well, uh, as long as we got, uh, we don't do some gnarly single track, I think I'll be good. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I am the first to not lie about my uh, my writing <laughs> my writing abilities. <laughs> no, it's perfect. You yeah. come out with just um, like I said, a lot of two track old wagon roads that that you didn't think still existed, but they do. Um, go out visit some old plane crashes and holes in the ground and uh, hot springs, nice. old western towns, ghost towns. You name it, we'll go find it. All right, all right. Now I just got to convince work to let me do it. 
There you go. I'll tell them I'm scouting for another charging station or something. I'm sure they'll, they don't listen to this anyway. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with some work related excuse. <laughs> yep. That, that route between Reno and Bend is uh pretty, it's, it's just too long for a, like a Tesla to make it. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing in there to recharge nothing those things. I'm, I'm doing outreach. What I'm looking for is people that are interested in hosting charging stations. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. like it. <laughs> now I just got to convince the bosses. <laughs> nice. Awesome, Ace. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, filling us in on your adventures and sharing a little bit about what uh, what you're doing and what you've done. So. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me on. Uh, the honor is mine. I appreciate it. Yeah, but of course. So I hope that wrist heals up quickly in uh, Kota and Baja Rally, both of those. Sounds good. Sweet. Looking forward to it. All right. Sounds good. All right. Awesome, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yep. Thanks. And bye-bye. All right, so that was Ace Nielsen, and I don't know, maybe, maybe downplayed it a little bit. I don't know, he didn't downplay it. Like he he had an off on the bike, and, and it hurt his wrist. And you know, my dad and I were down there, and we you know we went to lunch with him, or, or kind of early dinner, or whatever it was, and we could tell it was bothering him, but. Um, you know, nevertheless was a trooper and, you know, took some care of it, you know, wrapped it, did what he needed to. Uh, and then, you know, the next morning was lined up and it's, it's the adventure. The whole rally thing is, is it's an adventure. So for the very top of the field, there's going to be that group that's like, I am here in attack mode and I am going to make this happen. But uh, for, for those again, playing the home game is, is the larger group of this is there to be competitive, but it could be competitive in I want to run a clean road book and I want no penalties and I want to complete each day because each day, whichever event that you do, uh, is not easy. Um, you, you'll you know what I'm talking about if you've ever had a day at work where you didn't walk around much, but there was just so much drama and so much stuff physically, mentally going on, not so much physically that it tired you out, even though you didn't do anything physically. And then there's the other, Hey, this was just brainless work. I didn't do it, but I'm just physically tired because I was walking back and forth and doing stuff. Okay. Rally raid, rally racing is a combination of those two things. So every single day is an adventure and I don't want to downplay it or make it seem like this, but it is like the ultimate adventure because just imagine I'm going to hand you a piece of paper and you're going to go navigate this into the middle of nowhere. And you're going to see these sites and see these things that, you know, I'd, I'll never forget the day that uh, Steve Hengenfeld, Hengenfeld, Heng, uh came in after finishing one of the stages uh, at Baja Rally. Uh, the same with Garrett Pache also coming in. And, and But the big one to me was, was Steve Hengenfeld. I mean, this guy knows Baja. He's got a name for every rock, a name for every other bush, and then he knows every single corner of this. And for him to come back and say, I've never been down that road. And I've never been in this area and never seen this stuff. Is, that is huge. Because Northern Baja, Southern Baja, but Northern Baja is so well ridden, so explored. There's trails everywhere. There's all this stuff. So to have somebody say that uh, is is uh, something on the organization, and actually, and and it's directly related to uh, the work that Scotty Broman or, or uh, Scotty Bloom does from Baja Rally in creating those roadbooks and creating those routes. Um, and, and that's not to downplay anything that. Uh, the Darren Skilton from uh, Sonora Rally does because their routes and this year I there's you know there's challenges but still this year was a navigation challenge for a lot of people a lot of dune work a lot of that stuff but in the past like the the just the previous year you know you've got these huge water crossings and these mountains and all of this stuff and then these epic bivouacs the bivouacs were just absolutely amazing i saw the pictures i so regret not going but you know we were fresh in this whole toilet paper crisis and you know just didn't feel right you know just leaving uh to just pack up and leaving especially as my dad and myself and then just leaving my mom at home so we just didn't feel comfortable with that so that was our personal decision then but we got to see um, some of the stuff that uh, West by 1000 did uh, the coverage and everything that they did and the stuff that uh, the group basically from Sonora Rally put out and it was just amazing. And so I think that the people that are looking at getting into this is if you're looking at getting into rally, 
you know, we've talked about this before and it's just, you know, have your headspace. It's not, it's not about going out and winning this stuff. It's just about going out and riding some road books and having fun and bringing your buddies along and taking adventures and, and giving them crap because they made a left when the road book clearly said you made a right. Uh, and then you guys all wait on a ridge watching them and ride off into the sunset and Rochambeau to who's going to go get them uh, or who's gas he's going to get or um, who's going to open the waypoint and take the penalty so that everybody else can get the clean round. You know, I don't know. There's there's a bunch of games and a bunch of stuff that you can do. But the best part about it is, is you're doing all of that. But if your navigation's clean, you'll be surprised how far up the board you finish. So, uh, so great. Absolutely great. So I'm going to start planning on when I'm going to go to Oregon and how am I going to get out there. So um, because I have a feeling that Ace and company's got some really cool stuff to see up there. So I'm looking forward to it as I'm sitting here thinking and looking at pictures going, hmm, how do we make this happen? Well, we'll see. But anyway, it is episode number 25. There we go quarter of the way to episode 100 i got no idea what we're going to do for episode 100 but i am absolutely looking forward to it already and it's not even here yet so we got 75 more episodes to go just to get there and we got a lot more events and a lot more stuff coming up so kota rally coming up in september we've got uh baja rally also right at the end of september so kota rally is going to be right in the middle of September 10th through 14th, somewhere in that. And then you've got Baja Rally right at the end that bleeds from the September 26th over to the October 2nd. Uh, and that is going to be, this year is actually going to be a six-day event, six-stage, uh, if the information I've received is correct. Uh, so it is going to be amazing. So six days of rally raid uh, down in this horrible place known as Baja. And I say that as sarcastically as possible because Baja is pretty awesome. Mainland Mexico is awesome as well. Uh, I was seeing some of the stuff now with Sonora Rally, a few stages and stuff like that. So I am looking forward to doing all of these events and being there, hanging out. Uh, I will be at uh, at Baja Rally. I'll be down there with the Rally Comp crew uh, working on that and helping on that and helping the organization. And so looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great time. Um, and yeah. So uh, stay tuned. Like I said, I have got my suspension back from Alex over at Conflict. It's sitting in the garage, all nice and warm. I got some choice parts from Rottweiler, namely the intake to install uh, on my bike, and I am raring to go. So I'm happy we're recording this on a Monday, and you guys will be listening to this on Sunday, and hopefully I will be riding while you guys are listening to this on Sunday. So, yes. All right, so don't forget, follow us on social media, Chasing Waypoints underscore official on instagram chasing waypoints on facebook you've got the youtube also chasing waypoints and more importantly you've got the website chasing waypoints.com you're going to find a link to this in the facebook page or on the facebook page uh, that'll be linking you to the website so you can listen there via spotify don't forget we are also on apple podcasts as well as spotify and rocket podcasts and i don't know there's anchor does a great job of distributing it to a bunch of different uh platforms so if you don't see your favorite platform, let me know. Maybe I can make that happen. Uh, but don't forget, like, subscribe. Let me know in the comment section of that Facebook post if you got any ideas or any feedback or anything maybe uh, you want to hear from about Ace uh, and High Desert Adventures. Uh, maybe you're looking to sign up for that next, uh, that next trip that they do. So in the meantime, I hope everybody had a great week, is going to have a great week, and we will talk to you guys soon. Episode 26 coming in next week. Stay tuned.